Good morning. We're so glad that you are here with us this morning. Um, if, you are, if you're new here, you haven't been here for a while, just want to kind of bring you up to speed with, with where we are, um, kind of a refresher. Uh, we've been studying through the Gospel of John uh, this year. Mark has entitled this um, sermon uh, series, uh, a Genuine Jesus. And, and last week, um, uh, he, he's entitled the sermon, Lessons from a King in John chapter 12. And this week we'll be, we'll be carrying on the rest of John chapter 12, finishing that up, uh, beginning in verse 27. So if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, um, we're going to be looking at, at more lessons from a king today. Uh, we'll be concluding the chapter as we go through our time here together. But before we do that, I kind of want to dive into where we are at in the life of Jesus. For me, it's, it's helpful to understand the context in which we're dealing with whenever I'm studying scripture. And so at this point um, in the life of Jesus, we are in uh, the final week of his life uh, before the cross. Uh, the previous Sunday, he, he um, or a previous Friday, he traveled to Bethany, um, where on Saturday he had a meal in his honor at the house of Lazarus. That's where Mary anointed Jesus. Uh, the next day, um, on Sunday, he gets up and he goes and, and he rides the donkey into, into Jerusalem, what we call Palm Sunday, also known as the Triumphal Entry. The following day on Monday is when he, clen he, he cleaned, uh, cleared the temple for the second time, cleansing a, of the hypocrisy and the greed. And here we are on, on Tuesday in the final week of Jesus' life. And it's a long day for Jesus. It's, it's a day that um, many, of the, uh, many theologians call the great day of questions. Uh, th throughout this day, uh, he, he's fielded questions uh, from, from Peter. He's had several from the religious leaders. He's also asked the religious leaders some, and, and he's taught parables throughout it, such as uh, the Good Samaritan um, in response to them. And here, however, though, we're, we're in the last public appearance um, of Jesus with one final public sermon. And so I don't know about you, but if it's his last public sermon, I think maybe we should pay a little bit of attention to the words that he's saying and, and draw from those words. Because here on this Tuesday, um, as, he's, as he's wrapping up his public ministry, we are halfway between that entry when the people were screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna. In just a few days, they're going to be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And so the, the first lesson that I want to draw from, or what, that, I, that I see here, is, is to fulfill your purpose. To fulfill your purpose. In John chapter 12, starting in verse 27 and 28, we read this. Now my soul has become troubled. This is Jesus speaking. And what am I to say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And so we see in, the, in this lesson, he says, he says, it's to fulfill your purpose. See, Jesus had a purpose. He had a purpose for, for what he was doing, for why he came. And in that, in, in order to fulfill our purpose, we have to know our calling, know what, what we're called to do. And Jesus says, my soul is troubled. It, looking back at last week's passage from that, that Mark preached on, it, Jesus had just told people that he was going to have to die once again. And so Jesus is troubled because that's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing for him to live up to in that sacrifice, that, that purpose. He knows what is about to happen. He knows what is on the horizon. And yet this is the burden that he, that he carries. It's a burden that he chooses to carry, regardless of the cost. And as I was, I was reading one, one um, author or this week, as I was preparing, one author wrote, you know, should Jesus try not to carry that burden? And the, the answer is no, because Jesus understood what his calling was and was w willing to fulfill it even when it was difficult, knowing the pain, knowing the cost, knowing the struggle that was about to take place. Now, I don't want to jump too far ahead in the life of Jesus, but, but this, this passage, these few verses echo what, what Jesus is about to pray on the last day, or right before he's, he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he says, you know, what am I to say? Father, save me from this hour. When he's praying to God to, that if there's another way, but he's willing to do whatever he needs to do because he understood that his purpose was for this time. For Jesus to pray for deliverance here would be opposite of his calling. Even when life gets difficult for him, he stays true to his calling. 
And basically what Jesus is saying here, he's, he's like, I, this, is, this is a hard thing for me to do. I know what is coming. I know why I'm here. So let's do this. Jesus understands what it is that is about to happen and the implications that will come as a result of fulfilling his purpose. And just as Jesus has a purpose that only he can fulfill, we all have a purpose in our own lives that only we can fulfill. We all have, have a calling, a different calling. We're all called to go into the world and make disciples, and so we have the same mission, but the way we do that and, and what God asks us to do in that is different for each of us. Several months ago, we were back in John chapter 4, and, and we, we talked a little bit about this. I, I had a sermon on, on, on our purpose and our calling and the burden that God lays on our life. And so the question I have is, how are you doing with that? Have, have you identified the burden that God has? Well, what, what is it when you look in this world that breaks your heart? See, we all have a different calling in our life, so how are you doing with yours? Far too often... You know, we, we see people that, that, that say, you know, this, this certain ministry needs to be done here. And, and so we sit around and we complain about it or, or we call a, a, an elder or we call a staff member or we, we, can't, we talk to somebody and say, somebody should be doing something about this as if it was their calling on their lives rather than your own. And so if God is asking you to do something in your life, fulfill the purpose regardless of the cost. And that's the first lesson that Jesus is teaching us here. And then the next question that I, that I have is as we're going through um, trying to, to fulfill our calling, to know our calling, to fulfill our purpose that, that God has for us, uh, we have to ask ourselves, well, who am I trying to glorify in this? See, Jesus wants us to, wanted to glorify God. You know, Jesus, I don't, I don't think Jesus wants to die here. I think he's willing to die. I think he knows that's what, that's what has to happen, and so, so he's willing to do that. I don't think he necessarily wants to. And it's understandable that he wouldn't want to. But, but Jesus is not driven by self-indulgent desires. He's more interested in the Father's glory than his own comfort and his own glory. See, Jesus knew he was here to glorify the Father. He said, he said Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came out of heaven that said, I have glorified it and I'm going to do it again. Jesus was not here to bring honor to his own name, but rather to glorify the Father. And too often I fear that we live to glorify ourselves. We try to make our lives more comfortable, or we focus on our own wants and desires. And this past week, as I was, as I was studying through this passage, I began thinking about the choices that I've made in life, sometimes the choices I make on a daily basis, and I began to ask my question, am I doing these for my own glorification, my own comfort, my own desires, or am I doing them for God? And the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we live for, a, for ourselves or do we live for a higher purpose? When we know our calling, we can fulfill fill our purpose, even when it's hard, because glorifying our God has far more reaching impact than simply glorifying ourselves. The second lesson that, that I saw is, is, is that he's, he's trying to get across to the people is to believe in him. He, he, he almost pleads for them to believe in him. Continuing on in John, it says, So the crowd who stood by and, and heard it, so heard that voice in heaven, were saying that it, that it had thundered. And others were saying, No one angel has spoken to him. And Jesus responded and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for yours. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And so he, he urges us to believe in, in him, believe in Jesus, because judgment is coming. Judgment is here. You, you read this passage, and, and I begin to wonder, like, how could different people hear different things? Like, how could some of them say, no, it's thunder, and some people say, well, no, it's an angel, and, God say, and Jesus is saying, no, it's actually God. The truth is that we, we only hear God's voice when our hearts are open to hearing it. We only hear God speaking, we only see God moving when our hearts are open to hearing and seeing him moving. One author suggested that, that this voice that was heard was for the listener because to those who love Jesus, his death that was about to happen in just a few days would look like Satan had won. And to those who, who hated him that were there, it would look like God had vanquished him. But neither is true. See, as Jesus is about to explain, Satan will be the one who is defeated and Jesus will be the one who has won because judgment is coming. 
The word here that Jesus uses for, for judgment can also mean that there's this crisis that's taking place. Uh, but it also conveys the idea uh, that there's going to be a final settlement at some point. The crucifixion is the crisis that's taking place between Satan and God. And up to this point, Satan had earned his title as prince of this world. But the death, death of Jesus w will break the power that Satan has He'll break the power that Satan has, not only in this world, but, but in our lives as well. He will cast him out. And this isn't an immediate casting out where, where Jesus dies and, and is rose from the dead and then Satan's gone forever. It, it's more of a gradual thing that's going to take place. You know, the Civil War didn't end at the signing, or at the, at the, at the uh, Appomattox Courthouse. Rather, the, the Civil War continued on for 16 months after um, Lee surrendered. And just like that, good and evil continues to, to fight back and forth and the battle still rages. However, we do know this, that the kingdom of darkness will recede before the kingdom of light as the night withdraws before the rising sun because Jesus' death, his purpose, the, the reason that he came, his mission accomplishes that and brings in a new kingdom. And as usual, this, the lesson that Jesus is teaching causes some confusion. Continuing on in John chapter 12, it says, Now he was saying this, Jesus was saying this, that, that he'd be lifted up to indicate what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd then answered him, We have, we have heard from the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how is it that you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. Also the one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. And so he urges, he urges us to continue to, to walk in the light, to be in the light, to believe in him. And so they ask, you know, how can the Messiah die if he's to live forever? They were blinded by their own preconceptions and misunderstandings. And Jesus warns them. He, he, he kind of passes by that and, and warns them just to make use of the presence that he has with them while, while they still have it. You know, far too many of us are content to stumble around in the darkness when Jesus offers us a different way to live. You know, in the darkness, we have no guide. We have no security. I remember the first time I went to, to Haiti. I was with my father-in-law, Larry, and, and his brother-in-law, John, and, and we, we flew in in the afternoon and drove out of Port-au-Prince up, up this mountain and, and back down through this town of Mirabelle, and we came to this river that, that we had to cross in these dugout canoes. And, and we, as, we cross, as we were crossing, the sun was beginning to set, and so we had to get across the river quickly because they don't go after a certain time because it's dark and they can't see things. And so we got there and we got our stuff loaded up on these pack mules and, and, and some Haitians just grab some of our, our luggage and they start walking. And so I start following them on this trail, this place I've never been, right? And, and they don't use lights. They don't have like a bunch of flashlights around and stuff. And so I was, I was thinking I was going to be, you know, pretty good too and just walk through the darkness, you know, without any light, which is fine for a while. But if you don't know where you're going, that can get you in trouble. I don't know if any of you um, like to rearrange your house. Um, I hate it when my wife does because it always seems like whenever she rearranges the house, I'm walking through there at, at nighttime thinking I know where something is and I run into to, to something because it's been moved, right? Same thing, you know, we're walking along this trail in this place where I've never been and all I can see are these distant fires up on the mountain in these homes where they're, they're cooking or something. And as we're walking, Volner, the, the missionary, he was here just a couple weeks ago, was behind me. He said, hey, Matthew, uh, there's, a, there's a hole up there. Be, be careful. And I was like, oh, okay, no big deal. So I flipped my, my headlamp. I had a headlamp on. I just didn't turn it on, right? I flipped that on, and I looked, and, and sure enough, there was a hole. There was a trail about this wide for me to walk down. And so I made my way by that, no problem. Decided to leave the light on for the rest of the trail because I wasn't sure what other holes I may be coming across. As the, the week ended and we were headed back down, we came to that same point and I realized where I was at. 
and I look, and it wasn't just like this little hole, like that, like I step in and, you know, twist my ankle or something. No, if I were to step in it, I would fall like 10 feet down into the river that, that would be there, like this little creek that was kind of there. And, and, you know, we get, we are so confident in our lives that sometimes we're stumbling around in the darkness and we don't even realize the danger that we're in. We don't realize what pitfalls may lie ahead. And so Jesus implores us to walk in the light because there's no security, there's no safety in the darkness. The darkness is constantly trying to creep into our lives and we must stay focused on the light, and that is Jesus. When we do that, when we walk in the light and remain focused on the light, we become light bearers ourselves. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. If we believe in Jesus, if we're baptized into him, we have God living in us. We become light bearers. And so Jesus urges us to walk in the light because judgment is coming. Continuing on in, in John chapter 12, he says, These things Jesus proclaimed, and he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs in their sight, they still were not believing in him. And this happened, so the word of Isaiah, the prophet which he spoke, would be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their heart. So they will not see with their eyes, and understand with their heart, and be converted. And so I will not heal them. These things Isaiah said, because he saw his glory, and he spoke about him. Isaiah saw the glory of God. He, saw, he saw, foresaw who Jesus was going to be, and spoke about him. And, and John tells us that these people still didn't believe. This lack of believing is, isn't just that they couldn't wrap their heads around who Jesus was. It was that they were continually unwilling to believe. They were unwilling to, to believe in him. They just couldn't bring themselves to do it. And even with all the facts laid out, with all the miracles that they have seen, all the signs and the wonders, everything that Jesus had done over the past several years leading up to this point that, that he, he used to show and prove that he was from, a, from God, they refused to believe in. They refused. They still settled on the side of unbelief. You know, were they too focused on the miracle to see the miracle maker? Were they too focused on the blessing to see the one who blesses? Would we be too happy to live a life of blessing ourselves without the presence of God? Are you and I content to, to accept all the blessings of God without the presence of God in our lives? If all the blessings that we have received were stripped away and all that remained was Jesus, would that be enough? Would that be enough for, for you and me, or would we walk away as the rich young ruler walked away? Sad, because we got a lot of stuff. And John quotes Isaiah when he says the people couldn't understand because their hearts were hardened. And, and, and as you read this, this passage, you, you begin to ask, okay, well, who causes the hearts to be hardened here? Who is the cause of this? Who caused them to be blind? Was it God? Were the people to blame? You know, verses like this are, are, are why we need to look at the, the entirety of Scripture to get the full context, to get the, a full understanding of what is being said here. Because it's really easy to take passages like this and, and begin to say, well, only, only certain people can get into the kingdom of heaven. Only the ones that God chooses. But if you look at it, I'm not so sure that's what is really being said here. So who's to blame? In Matthew 13... Jesus, as he's teaching, it seems to indicate that, that it was the way in which he taught that caused the people not to understand. So, that, so it's the preacher's fault that they couldn't understand. Well, Acts 18 tells us, that the, that, and, and seems to indicate, that the person listening has chosen not to hear. So now it's the congregation's fault. John 12, though, tells us that God is the cause of all of it. All of it. So is it the preacher? Is it the congregation? Is it God? Which is it? I like what Mark Moore says. He said, The hardening of the heart is a progressive and cooperative effort between God and men. As men turn their backs on God, he withdraws his spirit from them. Thus they are less likely to repent and turn back to God. 
And, and as he says, this is a frightening proposition. Because the more we withdraw from God, the more we turn away from God, the more his spirit is withdrawn from us, is what scripture seems to indicate. But James also tells us if we draw close to God, he will draw near to us. We need to remain in the light. Keep striving for it. Keep, keep pushing towards that. Keep watch. Keep growing in our faith. Believe in Jesus. And to not let our hearts be hardened. Because judgment is coming. John 12 continues, says, Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, so that they would not be excommunicated from the synagogue, for they loved the approval of people rather than the approval of God. And so as, as we believe in Jesus, we have to consider what is it going to cost us? What is it going to cost us to believe in Jesus? Because at some point, at some point, if we are really putting God first in our life, it's going to cost us something. Because our, our, what we want doesn't always line up with what God wants. John tells us that many believed but were afraid of the cost. You know, the synagogue was the, was the epicenter of the life for the Jew. Being ejected, being excommunicated from the synagogue would have meant the loss of their jobs, would have meant the loss of their, their, some of their families, their friends, respect in the community. It would, have been a, it would have been a heavy blow for them. But John also tells us that they sought the approval of men rather than God. While some of the religious leaders actually believed in him, their hearts were occupied with the approval of men. And there's always been a mixed response to Jesus. There always will be. And those who did believe kept quiet. And what about us? What about you and me? What are we willing to risk to follow Jesus? You know, here in the United States, we typically don't have to risk a whole lot to, to, to come to a place like this, right? We don't necessarily always have to, but, but at some point, some point, our faith is going to cost us something. What are you willing to risk? Are you willing to risk your career or your family? Are you willing to risk the way that people might view you in the public? Where is that line for you? What keeps us quiet? Because the thing is that we have to remember that the praise of men is fickle and demanding. It's constantly changing and it demands um, quite a bit of us. And it often requires us to compromise our values. So what do we place as most important in our lives? And Jesus, Jesus urges us to believe in him and to consider the cost. And so Jesus kind of con concludes his public ministry here. He, he kind of summarizes everything that he had done for the last three years in this final appeal here in, in John chapter 12, starting in verse 44. It says, now Jesus cried out. He, he cried out. He, he was pleading with the crowd. And he said, the one who believes in me does not only believe only in me, but also in him who sent me. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that no one who believes in me will remain in darkness. If anyone hears my teachings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not accept my teachings has one who judges him the word which I spoke. That will judge him on the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. See, Jesus doesn't judge. Jesus saves. I'll say that again. Jesus doesn't judge us. He, he saves us. The truth from Jesus comes from the Father, and it's the truth that judges. Men will be judged by the gospel law. You know, people are judged by the rejection of God's words, but those words don't just bring judgment. They also bring eternal life. They bring hope. Because what God offers is eternal, not temporal. This life and the promises, the, the problems that you and I are facing are temporary. Are we going to sacrifice the eternal for our temporary comfort and satisfaction in this world? See, Jesus' words don't bring just judgment, but also eternal life. And throughout his ministry... Jesus highlights two personal characteristics that are repeated here in this, in this passage. The first is, is he highlights his, his relationship with the Father, his intimacy with the Father. And the second, he highlights the, the light that he brought into the world. 
And when we believe in Jesus, we too get to experience the, this intimate relationship with God. And we no longer live in darkness, but we walk in the light. See, genuine faith in Jesus leads us out of darkness. And genuine faith in Jesus brings about everlasting life. And so I don't know where you're at today. I don't know where you're at in, in your walk. I don't know where you're at in your faith. And, and maybe today you've been walking in the darkness, stumbling around, thinking that life is, is good, not realizing the pitfalls that are there. You've allowed your heart to be hardened. Today is a good day to repent. Today is a good day to be baptized into, into Jesus, to believe in him and to receive the Holy Spirit in your life so that way you're not just walking in the light, but you are a light bearer yourself. And maybe today you've been believing, but you've not been living your faith. Today is a good day to turn and walk once again in the light that you claim. And here in a minute, the, the, the praise team is going to come back forward and we're going to sing a, a song of decision. And as they do, if you have a decision to be made, the, uh, there'll be a couple of elders down front. I'll be down front as well. I think Mark might be in the back. If you just need to talk to somebody, pray with us. We're, we're willing to meet with you here. Will you pray with me?